Greetings and welcome to today's webinar uh, hosted by the Institute of Navigation titled Characterization and Performance Assessment of BEDO2 and BEDO3 Satellite Group Delays, published in the Fall 2022 issue of Navigation, the Journal of the Institute of Navigation. Today's webinar is being presented by one of the paper's authors, Dr. Oliver Montenbrook. Dr. Montenbrook is head of the GNSS Technology and Navigation Group at DLR's German Space Operations Center. His current research activities comprise space-borne GNSS receiver technology, autonomous navigation systems, spacecraft formation flying, and precise orbit determination, as well as new constellations and multi-GNSS processing. Dr. Montenbrook chairs the GNSS Working Group of the International GPS Service and coordinates the performance of the MGEX, the multi-GNSS experiment. He's authored numerous technical papers and various textbooks related to his fields of work. Oliver is a fellow of the Institute of Navigation and was also the 2018 recipient of the prestigious Kepler Award. You can download this paper and many more on the Navigation Open Access website at navi.ion.org. This website has tools that allow you to read, download, cite, and share valuable research content such as this paper. So thank you for being here. And now we will turn it over to Dr. Montenbrook. Thank you, Rick, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. A good afternoon to our audience in the US, uh, a good evening to those in Europe, and I'm not sure whether we have any night shift attendants from Asia. Anyway, uh, welcome to the seminar. I look forward um, to and hope to give you a good presentation today. Um, Rick already mentioned the title. It's about the characterization of satellite group delays in the Beidou system. And this work was performed uh, together with my colleagues, Peter Steigenberger and Andre Hauschild from DLR, as well as a colleague, uh, Ningbo Wang from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, I gratefully acknowledge their support in this work. Now, before going into technical details, let me try to motivate and give you some background why we performed that work. Um, as you all know, GNSS signals are radio frequency signals that basically serve the purpose of determining the distance between the user and the GNSS satellite. Uh, to do so, we use modulated radio frequency waves um, that have a so-called ranging code on top of it. And, um, those signals are then used to measure the travel time from the satellite to the user. If we had a perfect world, the timing would directly correspond to the distance. However, in practice, we face certain error sources and one of them are group delays or code biases. I will use those words uh, pretty much synonymously in the talk. Uh, that are related to the hardware of the satellite and of the receiving equipment. Proper knowledge of these group delays is important in yeah, numerous GNSS applications, uh, foremost in the code-based positioning, when you simply use pseudo ranges to determine your position in the handheld receiver, you have to worry about the impact of such biases if you don't know them. If you do analysis of the ionospheric path delays to measure the electron content of the ionosphere, you have to um, be aware of how big these biases are. But also in precise application that use carrier phase measurements and because resolution, uh, resolution depends on the prior knowledge of the code biases. Users basically today have two sources where they can get information of the satellite biases. One is the broadcast ephemerides that are regularly transmitted to the user from those satellites. They typically contain group delay information that is required for the instantaneous positioning in a receiver. And we have the International GNSS Service uh, and its analysis centers that regularly monitor satellite group delays for all satellites that transmit GNSS signals. Now, in this context, a couple of questions um, arise and uh, we will try to address them here in this presentation. Uh, one of the is, of course, how well can we determine those biases? How good is our knowledge of these biases? Um, 
a related question is how well can we separate the impact of the satellite on the total group delay uh, and separate it from the contribution of the receiver? Um, from a user perspective, of course, um, the user wants to know how good individual bias products are, be it those from different IGS analysis centers or those in, or in the broadcast ephemerides, and what is the impact of such uncertainties for the user positioning. Our analysis here focus on the Beidou system, which is the, say, the latest addition to the family of global navigation satellite systems. We will consider both Beidou 2, the regional system, and Beidou 3, the, uh, the global system, but focuses probably on the, on, on the global system here. Now, um, those code biases occur basically in, um, any equipment that is part of the transmission or reception um, chain of, a, of, a, of, of the signal. Uh, in the satellite, we have a navigation signal generation unit that generates radio frequencies. Um, we have amplifiers uh, that, that amplify the signal. We have an antenna that transmits the signal. On the receiver side, we also have an antenna, we have an amplifier, we have a front end in the receiver, and we have a digital signal processing. All these elements can give rise to biases that affect the total measurement of the signal travel time. And um, it is probably, say, intuitive that the frequency of the signal has an impact on the group delay, but there are more aspects to it. Uh, if we have a closer look, it's the modulation, the specific modulation of the signal. It is the bandwidth that we have available to process the signal. It is the particular chip shape of the signal. So lots of impact factors that, um, that can give rise to, to such biases and their actual magnitude. Um, an important part when we talk about satellite and receiver biases is to understand that, say, for conceptual reasons, we would actually like to separate biases and attribute them only to a satellite or to a receiver. This is intuitive when you have, say, pure digital delays, for example, uh, which simply extend the total travel time and which may arise somewhere in the satellite or in the receiver. If we can separate the biases in to individual contribution of the satellite and the, and the receiver, then we can, for example, uh, make use of the fact that if we observe one satellite here from two receivers uh, on the other side and difference the measurements, this range and this range, then the satellite bias here canceled and does no longer impact the result. Vice versa, if a single receiver here measures signals from this satellite and from this satellite, then the receiver bias is cancelled. So in this way, we can combine measurements to isolate either the satellite or the receiver contribution. However, um, this is to some extent only wishful thinking, and it turns out that in practice, um, we can in the first instance only measure the total, um, total contribution of biases, and that the partitioning into satellite and receiver-specific biases is not always possible. So this ultimately leads to the problem that um, we basically get receiver-dependent satellite biases. To understand that issue a little bit better, I, um, I, I try to make you a picture of the actual chip shapes that are transmitted by the GNSS signals. Um, Ideally, such a chip shape is a purely rectangular pulse, and the receiver tries to correlate a replica of that pulse with the incoming signal. Um, that works perfectly and completely receiver independent if those pulses were strictly rectangular. However, in practice, we suffer from a bandwidth limitation and other effects that distort the chip shapes. And with such a distorted chip shape, like the one that we have here in the plot, the blue one, as opposed to the gray one, you see lots of artifacts. We have a, we, the pulse starts in a slightly delayed way and we have that type of ringing. And with such a real signal, um, it depends very much on how a receiver tries to sense the, the actual chip um, center or, 
or start at the end of the, the chip. And this means that in the end, the measurement of a satellite bias becomes actually receiver dependent. And we will see examples of such receiver dependencies later on in this talk. As a general rule, um, satellites that use analog uh, signal generators like GPS, for example, have larger ship shape distortions than those modernized signals that use the um, that use the um, digital generation units like uh, Galileo, for example, and to some extent also Beidou. Um, the cleaner the chip shape are, the closer it is to a rectangular one, the more easy it is to measure biases and to separate the satellite contribution from the receiver contribution. Having a closer look at Beidou, uh, we should first um, note that Beidou actually is made up of two systems right now. Beidou comprises the regional system that was built up starting, I think, in around 2008, roughly, and is mainly a regional system with inclined geosynchronous and um, geostationary satellites, as well as very few medium Earth orbit uh, satellites. Beta 3, in contrast, is predominantly a global system with uh, the bulk of the satellites flying in medium Earth orbit like GPS, GLONASS, or Galileo. The old uh, or Beidou 2, which was the first system, has basically signals on three frequencies namely the B1i signal, the B3i signal, and the B2i signal at frequencies um, close to the GPS L1 frequency and something in the vicinity of L2 or Galileo is 6 and the frequency signal somehow adjacent to the GPS L5 frequency. The modernized signal, in contrast, has even more frequencies and uses frequencies that are fully compatible with those of the other modernized GNSS systems like Galileo or the modernized GPS. Um, you can see from this forest of, of, of signal that I've shown here, um, we, we have a multitude of signals now um, centered around the L1 band of, GP, uh, of GPS, that is the, the B1 band in Beidou. Um, we have signals here again at the B3 or E6 band, and we have the L5 band plus uh, the adjacent um, E5B band here, which is occupied by Beidou signals. The blue signals here, by the way, indicate open service signals. Red are military or restricted signals, but you see that even the um, open signals that we as geodesists or user, common users can benefit from are really many, many, many satellite signals. Concerning the compatibility between the two systems, we have um, the B1i signal also um, copied into the frequency plan of Beidou 3, and we have the B3i signal also retained as a component um, here at the B3 frequency. Other signals are more similar to, say, Galileo type signals or Beidou signals uh, using modernized, um, modernized um, multiplexing schemes. Uh, this table here, which I won't um, comment too longly, um, Com summarizes all the individual signals that users, civil users, can currently track from Beidou, one, uh, Beidou 2 and Beidou 3. We have a total of seven frequencies here um, with different signals in those frequency bands. And I show this chart mainly to um, introduce some of the signal designations that I will use in the sequel, namely those that observers uh, of the GNSS signals get in the so-called Rhinex in the receiver independent exchange format, the data files with observations that we usually process in the GNSS world. And these are basically the designations of the Beidou signals that we will deal with. I, and I will make use of those designations in some of the following charts and tables. The old Beidou, three sig uh, Beidou 2 signal, sorry, um, the C2i, C6i and C7i's have just one modulation on the frequencies that we can track and one signal component. For the modernized B1C signal, 
the B2B signal and the B2A signal, as well as the combined signal, we have the possibility to track either the data channel or the pilot channel or a combination of the two uh, that indicates that it, um, indicates these um, three modes here. Oh, sorry. Uh, the three modes here, the letters D, P, and X or Z, um, they refer to different tracking modes for this particular signal. Aside from the signal itself, we have a navigation message, um, which in the legacy signals is the so-called D1, D2 navigation message, and which, among others, provides bias information. On the modernized signals, we have the CNAV, um, the civil navigation messages 1, 2, and 3 on the different signals. Now, if we look at the information on group delay parameters that comes with those signals, we have uh, as part of the old legacy navigation message, the D1, D2 message and the old legacy signals, we have two so-called timing group delay parameters, um, timing group delay one and timing group delay two. Those are equivalent to the pseudo range difference for uh, signals on uh, of the say, um, so called C2I and C6I signals, all of the group delays refer to the legacy signal on the B3 frequency. And um, the timing group delay is simply the range difference between the measurements of the frequency of interest and the signal on the B3 frequency. If we look into the modernized signal, we again have timing group delay parameters um, for the B1C signals, the B2A signal, the B2B signal, and so on. And we have distinct biases for the pilot component of that signal. And in addition, we have so-called intersignal corrections, which uh, provide the user with information uh, of tracking between the data and the pilot component. So it's really a multitude of different quantities that we have to look at. But conceptually, what uh, the takeaway message here should be, Beidou refers all timing group delays to the B3I signal or C6I in the Rhinex designation. And by using those timing group delays, the user can then correct code measurements so that they can be used with the clock information in the in the navigation messages. And for the modernized signals, we have dedicated biases between the, uh, the uh, pilot and the data channel of the message. So all in all, Beidou provides the user with the necessary information that he or she uses for the position or needs for the positioning. Now, to begin with, let me have a look at the broadcast satellite biases. Um, this chart here shows in the top row here a chart uh, of biases, timing group delays or differential code biases for the individual signals. Here for the B1I signals, the B, uh, B2I signals, the B1C signal, the B2A signal and the B2B signal relative to the B3I signal. If we just look at the magnitude and each color point here is representative of one specific satellite with the blue ones referring to Beidou 2 and on the right uh, side, you see those of the Beidou 3 constellation and the different colors. Um, you can see that the overall range of biases here is on the order of something like 40 nanoseconds plus minus. 40 nanoseconds correspond to a range delay of about 10 to 15 meters. So this is the magnitude of the biases that has to be co considered in the positioning. And clearly, if you would neglect such a bias, your positioning would be grossly wrong. Um, if we look at the biases in the broadcast navigation message between pilot and data channels, we can see that the scatter is very, very small here for the B1I sig uh, B1C signal, it is below one nanosecond. And also for the uh, B2A signal, it, the scatter is very low, but we have a small bias here at around two nanosecond. 
We can also see that for signals in very adjacent frequency bands, namely the legacy B1I signals at 5061 and the B1C signal at 1575 megahertz, the biases can already assume a magnitude at the level of a couple of nanoseconds and the same holds for the differential biases between the B2A and the B2B signal. Um, what is also interesting to note here is that other than many other bias products, we can see that the mean value of the biases, and you can see that here, for example, here and here across the entire constellation is not zero. Um, IGS bias products usually are leveled to zero mean across the constellation. The same is not the case for the broadcast biases here in Beidou. And this is due to the fact, uh, and I have to say this is somehow an assumption, it is not fully documented, but um, there are strong indications that actually the biases are normalized to a factory value of one single satellite, namely the satellite CO3 for this legacy signal and the satellite C19, PRN19 of the Beidou 3 constellation for the modernized signals. So one factory calibration is kept constant and all other biases are aligned to that factory calibration of that single satellite. This is quite different from what is done in, in GPS or Galileo. Um, and it is interesting because that opens the way for precise timing uh, using these absolute bias determinations. Now let's compare what we have here um, in a timeline plot. Uh, the plot here shows the evolution of the transmitted broadcast group delay values over a full one year period, starting in January 21 and extending up to the beginning of 2022. Um, each colored line is representative of one Beidou 2 or Beidou 3 satellite. The bluish colors are the older satellites, the reddish colors are the newer satellites. And what we can immediately see here is that the transmitted values are extremely constant over the year. We can see a couple of variations. For example, here you see a small bump over a period of about one month, another one here. So that indicates that the actual values are updated typically something like once per month. Uh, otherwise, they appear very constant. And we have just a few single events, namely, for example, here a, a small step, here a small step, where apparently a bias really needed adjustment due to aging or equipment changes. We have also some events which I would interpret as transmitter switches where the control segment changed something in the satellite transmitter chain or also here for just a few days. Uh, in this case, of course, the biases uh, have to be adapted and the broadcast parameters change. Now, let's have a look at the uh, performance of the biases that are determined uh, by the International GNSS service. And um, the parameter that we looked at is again here the constancy or the, the variation, the scatter of biases over time. We looked into a time series of daily biases over a period of one day, in this case for DLR's bias product of the Beidou satellites, and looked at the scatter for each individual satellite and each individual type of biases. Then we determined the standard deviation for the individual satellite and these box whisker plots here show, show now the median value in blue, oops, sorry, uh, the median value in blue and the scat basically the scatter um, over the constellation. What we can recognize from this plot is that the the temporal variation of the estimated biases for the individual satellites and bias types is very, very small. It is typically at the order of one tenth of a nanosecond. And we should uh, emphasize that this scatter includes on the one side the physical variation of the biases of over time and the uncertainty of determining this bias from observation. So overall, the biases must be extremely stable and we have a say good precision in determining those biases from observation. Um, 
the chart here shows that for DLR bias product, but I may just say here, and you find more information in the paper, that for the Chinese Academy of Sciences product, we have a pretty similar performance. So we can argue that the biases are stable, which is good news for the users. They only change once there is a real equipment change on board the satellite or a switch of the equipment. And uh, otherwise, they are fairly stable and constant, uh, which is good because we can make use of those biases then in the positioning without having to update the information too often. Another quality factor is the consistency of our different bias products. How good are the how, how good do these bias products match? And there we face a little bit of a surprise after the last slide, which showed that the precision is very good. But here, when we compare biases, um, we can see that the consistency of different biases is less exciting than, than the precision. Um, let me first talk about the blue bars here, which show the difference between biases as determined in the DLR product and the Chinese Academy of Science product, basically from global networks of uh, ground stations that observe the satellites and provide observations which we can use to determine the biases. Here, we still have a fair level of agreement for the legacy signals over here, uh, those two bars, sets of bars, the blue ones, but uh, the consistency for the modernized signal gets actually worse and is at the level of maybe 0.4 to half a nanosecond, which is about 15 centimeters. We can also compare those products that are obtained from the IGS monitoring with the biases that are transmitted to users in the broadcast message. And this is shown by the green bar and orange bars, the orange bars for Beidou 2 versus the um, Chinese Academy of Science product, and the green bars, uh, the same for Beidou 3. And what we can see here is that those biases have even a larger scatter up to almost, say, close to one nanosecond for some of the biases, particularly for the bias that refers to the legacy B1i signal. And this is probably a bit concerning and um, tells us that we do have a, say, inconsistency between what the broadcast messages, navigation messages contain and tell the user and what independent measurements of those biases with a global network of receivers brings. And we even have inconsistencies between different analysis centers here that might use different networks of receivers. To investigate that a little bit closer, we uh, made an analysis in which we determined satellite biases with different sets of receivers. And we used basically um, four different types of receivers actually from different companies that are mentioned here. Uh, we used geodetic receivers from Septentrio, from Leica, and from Javad, and from Trimble, which are probably the, the leading companies and the leading contributors to the IGS network, and determined those biases only from receivers of a specific brand, actually, or type of receiver using specific technology. Then we compared those biases against the broadcast values and looked at the difference of the two as determined by different types of receivers. And these correlation plots now show really strange results. Nominally, you would expect that you have a certain scatter in the results. Um, but overall, one would like to have a point cloud that is basically somewhere in the center of that chart. Um, the scatter here shows um, from left to right and from up to down that for a given receiver, we have a varying level of inconsistency between the receiver estimated biases and those from the broadcast ephemeris. And we have receivers like, for example, here in this case, Septentrio, but also Leica here, where the differences or the scatter across the constellation and the difference between Beidou 2 and Beidou 3 results is extremely large, namely here up to eight nanoseconds in total. Whereas for other receivers, um, the receiver estimated bias seems to be much closer to the broadcast value. Um, this shows that in the first instance, um, 
the broadcast group delays are inconsistent with modern geodetic GNSS receivers tracking Beidou and that different receivers perceive the same signal from the different satellites in, in a quite different way. Um, so you cannot, and this brings me back to my introduction, not assign a unique satellite bias, uh, but you have to assign receiver-specific um, satellite biases. Looks a bit weird or sounds a bit weird, but um, that's the fact that we have to deal with here in this configuration. And particularly, we face really pronounced differences between Beidou 2 and Beidou 3, even though it is formally the same signal that is tracked or transmitted from these satellites the way in which these signals are generated in the individual signals gives rise to quite different signal distortions and different receivers respond quite differently to that. So for if we look at the, do a similar plot for the uh, modernized Beto 3 signals, uh, which of course only covers Beto 3, we see that the scatter is much smaller, but it's still um, at the level of about plus minus one nanosecond in total. Um, so we have to be aware that the biases that we determine from a given receiver set may not apply in the same way for the other one. And in the processing, we might have to deal with receiver-specific satellite biases in the future. Um, what is the relevance of all these biases for, for, a, for an actual user inside his receivers or her receiver? Um, to assess that, we have basically looked into the signal in space range error, or uh, called ZISRE, um, of the Beidou navigation message. Uh, a standalone receiver would do positioning based on the information in that navigation message, which comprises orbit information, clock information, and timing group delay information. And the quality of that information as a whole um, then determines how well I can do my positioning. And the figure of merit here is typically the contribution of those errors to the line of sight pseudo range. And if we can separate that into contributions of the orbit and in contributions of the clock and timing group delays. And on the right hand side in the table here, we see the results for different um, single frequency signals or dual frequency combinations. So we can ask ourselves a user that would do single positioning with the B1i sig signal, what is the contribution of those errors to the pseudo range? And we find that it's, for example, 12 centimeter only, which is a remarkably low figure for the orbit contribution, but something like 40 centimeters for clock and timing group delays. And overall, the user will experience a signal in space range error of about 40 centimeters. However, if we look at the ionosphere free combination of B1i and B3i, the legacy Beidou signals on B1 and B3, we suddenly see a notably larger contribution of the clock errors and the timing group delay errors, and the signal and space range error is uh, roughly 50% worse than what we had before. And we can also see, on the other hand, if we switch to the modernized signal B1c and B2a, the orbit contribution is always more or less the same, quite naturally, but the clock and timing group delay com contribution is much lower than for the B1i and B3i signal. So it pays off to really look into the most favorable combination of signals and to be aware that the modernized signals usually provide better results or allow a better positioning than the legacy signals here. Um, if we inspect the data more closely, um, we can recognize that the clock and timing group delay contribution in the um, signal and space range error here actually shows a notable satellite contribution. It's not just stochastic errors, not the random errors that we can have here, but each satellite seems to have a notable bias. And when we try to determine those biases of individual satellites in the clock plus timing group delay, we get the picture shown here, which for each satellite of the Beidou 3 constellation from left to right shows 
um, a set of color bars for the individual frequencies that gives us the gross average of the um, clock and timing group delay errors over time. And that is a kind of constant contribution in the broadcast ephemeris navigation message that degrades our signals and uh, degrades the user positioning accuracy. Those biases um, that we observe here in the clock and timing group delay values have um, a magnitude at the level of about one meter or, or 0.8 meter plus minus. And that of course is a major contribution to the signal in space range error budget. If we were able to correct for those clock and timing group delay biases, then we could do a navigation with Beidou that would probably um, correspond to signal in space range errors of 30 centimeters, much, much better than the current performance and much better than GPS, still a bit worse than Galileo. So, so these biases in the clock and group delay values are the main limiting factor for standalone Beidou positioning and um, yeah, we have to see how to deal with that. So that brings me pretty much to the end of my talk. Um, and I would like to summarize the key facts for you to take that home. Basically, the Beidou um, broadcast clocks refer to a single frequency, to a single signal, namely the V3I signal. And we need to understand the values of the group delays to do positioning if we want to use the navigation message along with other signal combinations. The broadcast navigation message provides information on those timing group delays, but the values in there appear to be not perfectly compatible with common receivers as we use them today. And that re actually relates to the way that these biases and the, and the um, clock values are determined in Beidou, but that would be a different story here. Um, so we do have a notable dependence uh, on the receivers of the deviation um, of those biases with respect to what the receiver in particularly for the B1I signal, that is the TGD1 coefficient. And we can see that there are substantial um, receiver specific group delay offsets between Beidou 2 and Beidou 3 when we want to combine those in a single positioning solution. The signal in space range error budget is dominated by satellite specific errors, both in the clock offset value, but also this offset is part or these errors are partly correlated with the timing group delay errors and it really depends which signal you use um, based on that, uh, what performance you get. So out of that analysis, we have a couple of recommendations. Um, first of all, that's a basically a recommendation for the geodetic community. Um, it is worthwhile and still necessary to perform a more comprehensive characterization of the Beidou 2 and Beidou 3 chip shapes. Actually, that requires special equipment. It's not completely easily done. Usually, you would do that with high gain antennas. Um, uh, but this would be required to better understand why the Beto 2 and Beto 3 signals are so differently perceived uh, by different receivers and how receiver uh, type specific DCBs uh, are caused and what their magnitude is. Um, a recommendation to the Beto control segment, the transmitted timing group delays should better be adjusted to match the average modern consumer receiver or geodetic receivers. The current values are not perfectly suited uh, for optimum navigation accuracy. Users, on the other hand, can do something they self, themselves. If they work with Beidou 3, they should better use the modernized signals rather than the legacy signal, even though that means to give up the compatibility with Beidou 2. But Beidou 3 as a standalone system does a perfect job. You actually don't need Beidou 2 if you can track Beidou 3. And if you want to combine Beidou 3 and the Beidou 3, Beidou 2 and Beidou 3 in a combined navigation solution or positioning algorithm, then you should actually treat those two constellations as distinct sub-constellations and allow for an adjustable inter-system bias here. That concludes my talk and I'm perfectly happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Oliver, for this excellent presentation. Uh, you may ask questions for Dr. Montenbrook by clicking on the Q&A button in your viewer. Type your question and we'll address those uh, one by one with our presenter. So we'll pause for a few moments to uh, allow you to enter your questions in. Well, we haven't received any questions yet, Oliver. I think typically that means you did such a great job in your explanation. <laughs> not, not sure. It was a very technical talk, and I hope it did not frighten the audience. But um, yeah, it got into many, many details. I do hope. Oh, there, there is one question. Um, thank you for the informative brief. Does Beidou define TGD and IC in the same manner as GPS? What are the similarities and differences? That's an excellent question. Thank you for raising that. Um, I did not mention that in the talk, but uh, be aware that the timing group delays are in fact uh, formulated in a different way. In GPS, the timing group delay is basically the difference in group delays between or clock values between um, the P1 measurement, the, uh, the pseudo range of from P code tracking on the L1 frequency relative to the ionosphere free combination of P1 and P2 signals. And that is, in other words, a scaled version of the differential code biases between those two signals. In Beidou, the timing group delays are really differential code biases between a given signal, be it the B1i or the B2i, and it's always referred to one common signal, namely the B3i signal. So that's the main difference. For the ISCs, um, it is um, in, in Beidou, the ISCs refer only to differences between pilot and data component of one given signal. In GPS, it is the difference um, relative to the, um, to the CA code tracking Oh, sorry, um, no, to the P1 value, uh, the, the, the bias between one signal and the P1 tracking on L1. Um, so there are differences. Um, the same names have slightly different meaning in these two constellations. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Hari Harblani, hi, nice to meet you again. Are these group delays different from the YONO delays? Um, yes, definitely. They are of completely different nature. The YONO delays happen, say, let, let me just go back to that first slide. Um, if we look at this slide here, the YONO delays happen between here and here. The group delays happen here and here in the equipment. Okay, well, thank you so much, Oliver. We appreciate your time and preparation and sharing this great uh, research with us. And we remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted to our website, usually within 24 hours. And additionally, the full technical paper can be downloaded from uh, the conference web, or sorry, the conference website, the journal website uh, at navi, that's navi.ion.org. Uh, and you can download this full technical paper and download citation tools, and there's options to share this article with others. So, Oliver, thank you so much. We wish you a good evening and look forward to having you join us again soon. Um, I just received here, there, there seems to be a chat, Paul Sefola. Uh, okay, thank, thanks for your kind, Mark, Paul. It's nice to, to see that you are on the, online. Um, I'd like to thank Rick and the IUN for the opportunity to present our work here. It has been a great pleasure for me. And if you have questions, I think my email address is well known in the community. Uh, feel free to send me an email. Have a good day, good afternoon, good night, good morning, whatever. Yeah, bye-bye.